Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Bill's lesson today is in Luke chapter 12, titled, The Worry of Anxieties. Good morning. Got a Bible with you, Luke chapter 12. Working our way through the book of Luke together here on Sunday mornings. We find ourselves in chapter 12. We're going to be down in verses uh, 22 and following. Luke 12. So you head to bed. It's time for bed. It's late. You're tired. You're sleepy. But you put your head down on the pillow and um, you can't stop thinking about whatever it is you're thinking about. You can't stop worrying about whatever it is. You can't stop being anxious. About you toss and turn, the pillow gets warm on one side, so you pull it over on the other side, right? And then your neck starts bothering you. You roll over on that side. You finally uh, graciously pass off into the netherlands of sleep for a couple of hours. But then something happens, there's a sound outside or who knows what, and you get awakened again, and the first thing that comes to your mind is, and it's crazier thoughts then than it was before you went to bed. You ever notice how crazy it is in the middle of the night? What you were thinking about during the day, you can kind of reason through it. But if you wake up in the middle of the night, you're, it's just like, are you that way or is it just me? I don't know, maybe it's me. Worry and concern, right? Anxiety. What does that do for you? Here's, here's what worry is, and we're all guilty of it. Worry is being miserable in the present moment about something that is not yet, it's yet into the future. So it's being miserable about something today, about something that I'm afraid I'm going to be miserable about in the future. It's like borrowing misery from the future and spending it today and paying for it with my current joy and peace that I otherwise should be having as a believer in Jesus. That's not a good recipe, isn't it? Here's the worst thing about the recipe. 80% of the stuff we worry about never happens. Never does. We fume over it, we can't sleep, we're upset, we acid reflux, I mean, all, you know, everything that happens with, we're all that way, we do. Worry literally sucks the joy out of the here and now for the sake of something that may never happen into the future. And the Lord has a lot to say about worry and anxiety, and we're going to be seeing that today. He says it a lot, but, but the, the main story, if you get nothing else and fall asleep from here on, is here's what Jesus said. Here's the overarching message when it comes to worry and anxiety. The, the message is, do not. It's a message. Here it is. We're jumping ahead in our chapter there in chapter 12. Do not worry about your life. Stop it. So here, I fixed you, right? Now we can all, can we pray? Can you lead us in prayer? We'll go home. <laughs> do not, he says. Do not seek. The emphasis, obviously, is mine. Do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. How are you doing with that? Yeah, well, you're normal. I know what it's like. Do not fear a little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Do not. What is God's answer to, to worry and anxiety? Don't do it. Now, believing in Jesus and following Him has such incredible promises for the hereafter. But sometimes we, we think that that's all that it is. Coming to faith in Jesus, having a personal, having a personal encounter with Jesus. I'm not saying well, you know whether Jesus is the Savior. My question to you is, is he your Savior? Have you accepted him? As your, has there been a point in time in which you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior? You have to have that. There has to be a point in time in which you've turned yourself over, you've confessed your sins, you've repented of who you were, of whatever you thought was going to save you. And you've turned to the Savior. There's only one Savior. You have to be saved. You cannot save yourself. When you did that, it wasn't just a home in heaven that was brought to you. It was also a, a life here and now of far better quality than anything you could have outside of Christ. Part of that quality is peace and joy in the here and now. Jesus preaches on this topic. He revisits this topic on a regular basis. We find it here in Luke chapter 12. We'll find it in Matthew 6 in the, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Some two and a half years or a year and a half before he ever preaches what he does here in, uh, in southern Galilee. Why does, this, why does he come up with this topic all the time? You know? Number one, because people don't listen. Maybe you're different. I'm not. 
How many parents here, you only had to tell your kids one time, and they caught it, and they ne you never had to say it to them again? I, I want to know who you are, because you, we need you to leave, because we, we, can't, we can't handle perfection in this room. If Whatever recipe you have, we need to know it, because, man, we, we, none of us else had it that way. Jesus has to repeat himself, because people don't listen. Jesus has to repeat himself also, because he's itinerant. What does that mean? He's traveling from city to city. For the three years of his ministry, he goes from one place to another place, to another city, to another village, to another group of people, to another uh, crowd, to another circumstance, another situation. This is just one of the circumstances here. As he's preaching to this guy, speaking to this guy, who goes, someone divide stuff between my brother and I. He uses this opportunity to tell the parable of, of the rich fool, and then he goes on to talk about how, what we should be worrying about, and we should not be worrying about as he says here, not be worrying about our lives. So he constantly is repeating himself because that's what happens. I, 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 I preach a lot of weddings. And you know what? I found out this true for, for my weddings. Right, guys? I say the same thing every time. You want to know why? Because what I said last time was correct and good, and so the next wedding is, I need to say it again. So every time Jesus went, goes to a new place, every time he's around a new group of people, he says the same thing over again. Because that's just, that's just part of what his ministry is. So some, some people read the New Testament, they read Jesus speaking several times about the same subject, because that's what he had to do. Matthew's recording one incident, and Luke's recording a different incident under different circumstances, and all, not all the words are the same. Every time you told your kids to do something, you said the exact same words, right? No! Circumstances change, situations change, whatever changes. So you same message, different wording. Likewise, you find that in the New Testament, as Jesus teaches on many topics, not the least of which is this issue of worry and doubt and fear. So Jesus takes these issues head on. We, we worry about material things, what we're going to wear. We worry about spiritual things. Where am I going to go? Jesus takes these things head on here in this passage here in Luke 12. Notice what he says again, jumping ahead in our chapter. Do not worry. Your father knows that you need material things. He knows that you need these things. D did you know that? If he's your father and he cares for you, and he does, that he knows... End of worry. End. Should be. Do not fear. Here's that's the physical things, now the spiritual things. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So he's not just taking the here now, but also the hereafter. Nothing to worry about. He's taking care of the worry is completely unnecessary. So why do we do it? Well, a couple of reasons. One, ignorance. Just, we're just plain, we're just ignorant. No, not offending you. But a lot of people worry, Christians worry, spend their life worried because they don't know God very well. They know Him as Savior, but, but, but they don't spend time in the Word. Tell, tell me, tell me or don't, nod your head or shake your head or say, oh me or whatever, how much time you're spending in the Word every single day. Tell me, are you? See, see Pastor Greg and I have a problem. Here's, here's my problem. It's a pet peeve of mine. I'm going to share it with you and, and you can just take it for whatever you're worth. Most of you, some of you are not from here, so... There's some weird pastors down there. Yeah, we are. <laughs> because people come to us, and they want us to fix them. Help me, pastor. And that's great. I mean, pastors, that's what we're here for. We're here to serve. We're here to care for them. But, but many times, in the process of fixing you, we'll ask you a question. So tell me about your private Bible study time and prayer time. Almost non-existent. So, so the avenue, hear me, through which God, through His Spirit, is speaking to you about the issues of your life and the needs that you have and who He is, you have that avenue closed off. And you've gone around that and come to a pastor because we are miracle workers, right? That's why you pay us the big bucks. How, how, if you're not doing what God's told you to do, how can we help you? I mean, really, How? So, so a, a lot of times we worry because we are ignorant of the promises of God and the person of God. Just that simple. Tell me about your Bible study, personal Bible study. I'm not asking, if, obviously you're here on Sunday. I'm asking about your personal Bible study, day to day, where God is feeding you and speaking to you about himself, this relationship that he purchased by Jesus hanging on a cross to be, so that you could be his. Tell me about the time you're spending on that relationship. Because if you're not, I mean, you're going to be full of worry. So the second, for every reason, because of ignorance, number one. The second reason why we worry is because of unbelief. Even though we know, we don't believe. And that's obviously a more dire sin, to be sure. 
the greatest deception, and we've already rolled this horse over a couple of times, beating both sides, even though the, the horse is dead, right? The greatest deception and scam on the planet is teaching something that isn't true about God. The greatest deception and scam, the, the greatest robbery happening on the planet today is somebody teaching us, us learning a diminished view of the actual person and character of God. Because I'm telling you, if that's your position, you're going to be full of anxiety and worry. You will. Because you don't know him. You have to know him. It is possible as a Christian to live a whole life as a worrier because of your ignorance of God. It's also possible of, of, as a Christian to live an entire life as a worrier because you don't believe him. That's, like I said, a serious sin. It is. So let's consider what Jesus has to say about worry and anxiety. Why? So that's why we worry. So why should we not worry? What is worry? Well, worry is several things. Number one, worry, we worry. It is a failure to understand the purposes of God. Let's look at what Jesus has to say here. We're in verse 22 and 23. It's a failure to understand the purpose of God. Do you know that God has a purpose for your life? You have a very good reason not to worry that. Now, if you think you're out there in the wind, you know, and that God's not really overseeing anything, like I said, you have a diminished view of who God is, well, then I can tell you why you're worrying, because you don't understand who God is. But if you understand who God is, he has a purpose for your life. You have no reason to worry. Watch what Jesus says here, verse 22. He said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not be anxious for your life as to what you shall eat, nor for your body as to what you shall put on. For life, here's a very important axiom, life is more than food and the body than clothing. You have a greater purpose in life than just to be fed, clothed, and have a roof over your head. You see, a lot, I see a lot of people online and other places saying, yeah, I've got it all together. I've got a good woman next to my side. I've got something to drink and something to eat. I've got a good house. Life is full. Really? I mean, that's all? That's your whole purpose. That's everything. So you're in a wreck on the way home, and everything ceases to exist for you. Wow, how sad is that? That is not true. That's true for a lost person, not true for the child of God. You have a purpose. And it's greater than having food on, on your plate and, a, and clothes on your back and a roof over your head. It's far greater than that. In fact, these things are a means to an end. God created you for a much higher purpose. Here's our purpose, guys. Our priority is to bring Him glory, honor, uh, bring attention to Him, proclaim the gospel, live Christ-like lives. This is the priority. This is the purpose of God. You've got to have food and clothing and money in a house to be able to do those things. God knows that. He knows that. Because of your higher purpose, you're going to be confident of these things. No need to worry. No need to worry. Not an issue. So, so, so if all you are is a person who exists to be clothed and housed and fed, how are you better than your cat? What does your cat do? What's his purpose? Sleeps all day. Eats food, drinks out of your toilet, scratches your furniture. Nothing wrong with being a cat, as long as you're a cat. But if your existence is no greater than your cat as a human being, what are you here for? We're taught so many lies by the evolutionary uh, philosophies that are out there. There's no difference between aborting a, 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 a litter of ba a, 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 a human baby and a litter of cats. Holy cow, there is. You're of far greater importance far greater we have a purpose how can we how can we not worry because you have a purpose from god it's greater than any of the stuff that you're worrying about god has created you for this purpose he's intended you for this and so the other stuff the the stuff that gets you there it's going to take care of that i don't need to worry about that let's say i go down to to a, a junkyard and I build myself a car from the parts that I find there. I reassemble a Frankenstein car of some sort. What, why, am I do, why would I do that? Number one, because cars are expensive. Number two, because I, wanna, I need a car. What do I need a car for? Do I need a car to sit in my garage? Not a car like that. In my driveway? Not a car like that. Do you, what do I need a car for? To get me from here to over here. And when I get back in it to get from over here to back 
over there. So let's say I spend all this time and all this energy and I make myself this Frankenstein car, but I do not put gasoline or a battery in it. Doesn't that sound dumb? That's, that's insane. What's the purpose of this car anyway? To get me from here to over here. It's got to have gasoline and it's got to have a battery in order for that to happen. You follow me? So, so naturally, I'm going to do that. God's created you for a much higher purpose, to, to parade him, to carry him everywhere you go. He's going to take care of the gas. Of course he's going to take care of the gas and the battery. Of course he's going to make sure you're provided for. Uh, the means to the end, it's the end that he's interested in. Getting you there, no big deal. Nothing to worry about. We worry because we fail to understand the purposes of God. Number two, we worry because we fail to understand the provision of God. Look at verse 24. God's providing for us. Consider the ravens. Does God provide for ravens? Yes, he does. Watch. For they neither sow nor reap. You don't see them. They don't own fields anywhere. They're not driving tractors. They're not planning and praying for rain. Or, and more importantly, hear me, are they worrying about any of that? Never crosses their mind how sweet it would be, Right? Neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn. Yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than birds. See, we worry because we do not understand the provision of God. Why does God provide for birds that are only here for three or four years and then poof, they're gone? Because he wants to. They're his creation. They, they have a, a spiritual purpose, don't they? Because each bird in, demonstrates the creativity of God. The sustainability of God, the provision of God, it says it right there. They bring glory to God by their short existence. Have you, have you noticed, I was, found it very interesting, uh, the Marianas Trench, you know, 36,000 foot deep trench out here in the Pacific Ocean that we re recently reached in the past 10 years have, have had the ability to travel down that far to actually see what's on the bottom. And you know what they found? It's full of life. Now, isn't that crazy? So for thousands of years, we've never been able to see down there, and yet it's full of animals. They're all eating. They're all living. They only exist for the purposes of God. They're not for our eyeballs. God didn't create them for us to see. They created them for Him. God, God just allows them to exist. He creates them, and He feeds them because He likes that. It demonstrates the creatability and the kindness and care of God. What purpose do they have, spiritually speaking? Almost none. And yet he provides for them. They're li literally living large down there. You have a much, almost infinitely greater purpose. He takes care of them. Is he going to take care of you? Oh my goodness. Do you not understand the provision of God? Do we not understand the provision of God? We worry because we do not understand that God is providing for us. And then a third reason. We worry... Because we do not understand the prerogatives of God. Your life, hear me, is God's prerogative. It's not yours. In other words, God owns it. You're here because God wants you to be. Amen, right? And when he doesn't want you to be, what happened to him? God was done. Your life as a child of God, you're bought by the blood of, of the Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to be, we're going to be uh, uh, honoring that in the Lord's Supper in just a minute. Just the, 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 the story, the, the, the supper of God's provision for us spiritually. The, the do not worry supper. Don't worry if God's done this for us. We're going to be just fine. God, God's provided for you and taking, taking care of you and you belong to him, and your life is his prerogative, and you're here as long as he wants you to be. See, when you understand the prerogative of God, you understand you don't have a reason to worry. Because you're immortal until God says you're done. You really are. The devil's not taking you. No one else is taking you. Uh, you're not leaving. Notice the, the prerogative of God here, verse 25 and 26. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? It's a very good question. And if then you cannot do even of this very little thing, why are you anxious about other things? The, the word cubit there is, is a reference to a measure, and it was the measure from the tip of your pinky 
to the bottom of your elbow. It was a standard of measure in those times. They would measure stuff. They didn't have tape measures and rulers and other things. They would tell you it was 30 cubits, 40 cubits, 60 cubits, or whatever. It was a standard of measure, basically 18 inches. They would measure everything that way. 18 inches is not talking about your height. If you could add 18 inches to your height, that's not a little thing. That's huge. I'd be like 7 foot 5 or something like that. I mean, it's ridic- be ridiculous. It'd be higher than that. 7 12. That would be ridiculous. He's not talking about your height. He's talking about the span of your years. So, so let's think about the span of your years, not in a measure of time, but in a measure of feet. Okay? So how long do you plan to live? Let's, let's give you 80 years, okay? Because it's easy for my math. All right, let's do that. So, so let's say that every day of your life is equal to one foot. So th- after one year, 365 feet. You follow me? So after 80 years... You have a total of 30,000 feet of a lifespan, or 360,000 inches, okay? Jesus says, if you worry every day of your life, you're worried and tormented, you can't hardly sleep, the pillow's hard, it's cold, it's warm, it's whatever, you got to get up in the middle of the night to take medicine, to keep yourself from being so upset. Listen, if you do that every day of your life, you can't even add this much, to it. By the way, 18 inches over 80 years, you know, that's only a quarter inch a year, less than a quarter inch. You can't even add a quarter inch to your life by being upset all year long. Because why? Because your life is the prerogative of God. You cannot shorten it. Hear me. You cannot extend it. It is totally for God to decide. I'm about to say something you're probably not going to like. We went through a lot of health issues recently. I don't know if y'all noticed that. Concerns. Maybe you noticed everybody wearing masks. Maybe you didn't. I don't know. Maybe you were just out there. Did you notice that? We didn't have church. Our world's been turned upside down. China's still shut down. All for the concerns of health. Hear me on this. All that worry that we did didn't extend our lives at all. Shh. We can't say this publicly because we get, you know, deplatformed or something. Tell nobody, but it's God who has the prerogative over our lives. Now, I'm not saying don't take precautions and don't do your part and don't take your medicine and don't go to the doctor. I'm not saying that. But I am saying don't worry about it for crying out loud. God's in charge, ladies and gentlemen. Worrying about it is a sin, And Jesus says that, do not, you can't even add this much, you worry all day every day, to your whole life at the end, you can't add 18 inches to it, because it's God's prerogative, not yours. It's God's. God has a purpose for you, you're going to exit this life when he says so, and not until then, and you can't add anything to it. And one more thing. Worry is a failure to understand the prerogatives of God. And finally, worry is a failure to understand your value to God. We've already hit this subject several times, but consider what it says here in verse 27 through 31. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. You think flowers worry about how pretty they are? But they're pretty. Wow. I tell you, even Solomon, all of his glory, did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so erased the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, O men of little faith? Do not seek what you shall eat. Do not. What you shall drink. What you, what, what, do not keep worrying, he says. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need them. Seek first his kingdom, and these things shall be added to you. Wow, what a statement. Have you, ever, have you noticed flowers? How intricate they are? The design of something that's going to live for maybe a week? The, the beauty and the design and the, just the majesty, it's staggering. The colors, the form, the texture of these. Uh, these are clip art things, obviously. So, so God... For, for something that lasts no more than that, decks them out so beautifully, how much more do you think he will deck you, if you will? 
with a much higher purpose. Then a flower. Does the flower bring glory to God? Of course it does. It's here for a week. It looks pretty. It's over. Next year it will happen again. You remain. You have a purpose and a place in, in the kingdom of God. Even, even the wealthiest man who ever lived, Solomon, who was the best dressed man, never was dressed this well. Never. The purpose is the flower compared to the purposes of a child of God. Like Jesus says here, O oh, men of little faith, why do you worry? Why are you anxious? Because you don't believe him or you're ignorant of him. So, so, so let's get down to brass tacks. So if you're worrying, let me ask you these questions. Why don't you trust him? Why not? You, you know what he's capable of. You know what he says, what he promises, so why don't you trust him? So what part don't you trust? Is it his knowledge? Is God just not smart enough for you? Is that what it is? No. So what about his application of knowledge? What about his wisdom? Is he not wise enough for you? I'm just not sure if I can trust him. You're going to find a wiser one than that? You're not, obviously, wiser than that. What, what about his compassion? So hanging his only son on the cross to pay for your sins that you didn't ask to be paid for, nor did you even know, plus it was 2,000 years ago. He did all that because he was compassionate and he knew that you needed a Savior. Are you worried about that? You worried about his compassion? You worried about his care? Maybe you think, here's a blasphemous thought, that the devil is stronger than he is. That is blasphemy. He will forgive you for that. But that's blasphemy, ladies and gentlemen. We have no place. There is no place in our lives for worry because we belong to the Father. The Father knows that we need these things. The Father knows that we need to be provided for. The Father knows that we're capable, and His capabilities of providing are amazing. Amazing. We have nothing to worry about. Nothing to be anxious about. I'm going to ask you if you would bow your heads. Close your eyes with me as we think on these things. God, I thank you that you are the providing God, that you are a loving God, that you are an all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful God, that you see us, that you know what we're going through, that you care for us, God. Forgive us, God, for our worry. Forgive us, God, for our doubt. God, I pray today as we conclude this service and as we take your communion supper lord that we recommit ourselves again to you saying god you're you're sovereign over us our lives is your your prerogative your your provision your care for us is immense we have no reason to be concerned or worried thank you for this great lesson today blessed in our hearts we ask in jesus name amen Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.